SCHD is Schwab's U.S. Dividend Equity ETF, and it had been on a 10-year run up to the end of 2022, where it actually outpaced the S&P 500 in total return. And dividend investors rejoiced, value was back, and the party was on. Then 2023 hit. SEHD has severely underperformed the S&P 500, growth investors are calling us dumb again, and we're wondering where it all went wrong. Okay, so maybe I'm exaggerating just a little bit, but when it comes to returns, I'm definitely not. SEHD has a total return of negative 0.48% in 2023 versus the S&P 500's 18.71%. But let's get the first thing out of the way. SEHD and the S&P 500 are two very different investments, so expecting them to have the same type of returns every year just doesn't make any sense. And just at a basic level, the S&P 500 represents the 500 biggest companies in the U.S., while SEHD tracks the Dow Jones U.S. Dividend 100 Index, which effectively is 100 companies with high dividend yields that meet quality criteria around dividend growth, return on equity, and free cash flow to debt. And while half of the SEHD companies are in the S&P 500, there's a whole other 450 additional companies that aren't in SEHD. So depending on what's going on in the market, they should act differently and we should expect that. But what dividend investors really want to know is, okay, but how come these other dividend ETFs are outperforming SEHD in 2023? And there's definitely some truth to that. So I started digging around to figure out what's going on. I picked six other popular dividend ETFs, and here's where they're at so far in 2023. We have Vanguard's Dividend Appreciation ETF, VIG, is up 7.59% in total return in 2023. Vanguard's High Dividend Yield ETF, VYM, is up 1.22%. iShares Core Dividend Growth ETF, DGrow, is up 4.82%. iShares Select Dividend ETF, Divi, is actually down negative 4.74%. The Spider S&P Dividend ETF, SDY, is also down negative 2.57%. And then lastly, the iShares Core High Dividend ETF, HDV, is up 1.74%. So as you can see, SCHD is somewhere in the middle. It's definitely not the worst performer, but then it's also nowhere near the best performer either. And it's natural to wonder, like, if these are all dividend ETFs, why are the returns so different between them? Well, of course it has to do with how the ETFs are actually constructed. And the crazy part is, once we understand how they're different in terms of their criteria, and we know what's going on in the market, the performance actually makes a lot of sense. And we're gonna go over all that in detail right now. I put together a simple workbook comparing SEHD and the other six dividend ETFs. If you saw my video on QQQ and the growth ETFs, I created the same kind of breakdown, but for the dividend ETFs. And this way I can get a quick view of each ETF, what index it tracks, and then the one sentence version of the criteria it uses, and of course, some basic stats about the fund. And if you're trying to understand how the dividend ETFs are different, trying to decide on which one makes sense for you, then it's an easy to consume guide to help you dig into it. More importantly for this video though, it's gonna help us understand why the dividend ETFs are performing the way that they are. But before we do that, we need to talk a little bit about the type of market that we're in. Interest rates in the U.S. have risen, and in general, this impacts certain investments and certain type of stocks more than others. And here's why. So first, profits are impacted by rising rates. A company's profits can be impacted by rising interest rates in a couple different ways. One, if they have a lot of debt, the cost to service that debt can rise quickly depending on their timelines and terms. And two, the ability to grow as a company slows down as cost of capital goes up. So companies look to cut costs and get lean since the growth prospects aren't as great or easily accessible. And then three, businesses with international income will see lower revenues. When the dollar is stronger compared to other currencies, it means international revenues tend to be lower due to the exchange rates. And that's why you heard the phrase currency neutral basis all over earnings calls over the past few months. These are companies trying to show that their results would have been stronger except for that currency conversion. And in some cases, companies can be impacted by all three of those things. But ultimately, if investors think profits are going to be impacted, then it can bring stock prices down as they look for other places to put their money. Which brings me to the second reason stocks get impacted by rising rates. There's more places to put your money, especially for investors who are trying to generate an attractive yield. In 2021, the 10-year Treasury yield was 0.93%. Savings accounts were paying just about nothing. So the best option a lot of times is a quality dividend paying stock where you can get three to 4%. So just like the market, dividend paying stocks and ETFs did extremely well. But fast forward to 2023 and we're in a different world. The 10 year treasuries are over 4%. Savings accounts and money markets are four to 5% easy. So income investors can get the same yield they were getting before, maybe a little more, 
with little to no risk at all. Or if they want to take some risk, they're going for high yield derivative income funds like JEPI or the Yield Max funds to try to take advantage of a down and choppy market. So naturally, you're going to see money flowing out of traditional dividend investments and more into treasuries and high yielding assets. And the type of dividend stocks that are going to get hit the most by this are the ones that are usually the most attractive to income investors. And that basically includes REITs or real estate investment trusts because they usually pay a high dividend so they're a favorite of income investors. Plus, they usually carry a lot of debt so they're likely to see profits and expansion opportunities go down, which is a double whammy. And then also utilities and telecom services. Now these companies usually pay a good stable dividend and they tend to use and carry a lot of debt as well. So again, they're favorites of income investors and likely to see impacts to their profitability. And then lastly, high yielding dividend stocks and dividend aristocrats that are stable but grow slowly. Because again, the stability and high dividend yield are attractive to income focused investors. And then dividend stocks that don't necessarily pay a high yield but still have some decent growth opportunities, they'll be impacted too but not quite as much because they don't have as many income seeking investors in those stocks. Okay, so now that we know who should be impacted, let's take a look at these funds and see if they're acting the way that we expect. The worst performer is Divi. Now, if you look at their criteria, you say, oh, it's because of the REITs. But actually, although REITs aren't excluded in the top part, they are effectively excluded by the bottom criteria since they require a dividend payout ratio of 60% or less. And REITs are required to pay out 90% of earnings to get that special tax treatment. So, there aren't actually any REITs in Divi, believe it or not. But what Divi has is utilities, and a lot of them. The fund is a whopping 26% invested in utilities, so no doubt that is dragging them down. And now the next worst is SDY. SDY actually includes REITs, and it has over 4% of the fund in that sector. So that's definitely a part of their underperformance. But they're also the only other fund to have over 10% in utilities. So the combination of those two is likely what's bringing down SDY compared to the rest of the group. And now SDHD is next, but we'll hold off and do that one last. So if you look at HDV and VYM, both of these are taking U.S. dividend paying equities and then mixing in some proprietary screening methods. But what they have in common is they both have no REITs and they both only have about 6 to 7% exposure to the utility sector, which seems like it makes sense when you compare their performance, which was generally better than the other two. Now, if we look at Degro with a respectable 4.82% total return in 2023, it has 6% exposure to utilities like the other two, but it also automatically cuts out any companies who are in the top 10% of dividend yield. So by its criteria, it's trying to eliminate more of those high yielding stocks, which are going to be more impacted by the current market. And then lastly, if we look at VIG, it has a little under 3% exposure to utilities and automatically cuts out the top 25% of dividend yielding companies. So again, it's going to hold even less of the type of companies that are most likely to be impacted by the current market conditions. And of course, VIG also has companies like Apple and Microsoft in it, and they performed really, really well. So obviously that helps. And to that point, obviously each of these ETFs has like hundreds of stocks in them. So the things that I'm talking about, I'm just speaking in general terms. They're all going to have a stock that they picked that performed really well and another one that they picked that didn't. But I do think it's interesting that using the criteria, we can see that the performance is different based on what we know about the market. And to me, that makes this comparison pretty meaningful. And lastly, SCHD. So if you remember from my SCHD criteria video, I said this, probably the most controversial part of their criteria. And we're going to talk about why here in a minute. But they basically do a sort with you know, highest to lowest by dividend yield. And so once they sort that list by dividend yield, then the top half of the list are eligible to be put into the index. And this is where SHD's criteria is working against it, because the funds that are cutting the top yielding dividend companies are insulating themselves from this market rotation. But SHD's criteria means that it's only picking from that top 50% of dividend yielding companies. And even though they're using quality criteria like free cash flow to debt, return on equity, and dividend growth, it's not enough to make up for those income-minded investors that are likely leaving for other opportunities. Because believe it or not, SHD has the lowest exposure to utilities at 0.32%. And they have no REITs either, but the index that they track focuses on the highest yielding dividend companies by design. And that doesn't mean there's not quality stocks in there because there are. And that's likely why it's basically flat in total return this year, while other funds are down quite a bit more. But it's also why it's not matching the returns of its peers that specifically cut out the top dividend yielding stocks. So what does this actually mean for the future of SCHD? So I said in my previous video that 
SHD is still a great ETF, you just have to understand what it's great at. SHD is about finding high quality dividend growth stocks with high yields that may be currently undervalued at the moment. That's literally what the index it tracks is searching for. So if you think the current market conditions with interest rates are going to continue for a long time, then SHD may not match the performance of its peers. And depending on what your goals and time horizon is, that may or may not work for you. Now, if you think this is a temporary thing and we'll get back to lower interest rates and treasury yields, then the performance will likely reverse back closer to what it was. And if you're not sure, that's where having a diversified portfolio of assets that complement each other helps to balance out the uncertainty. But again, like I always say, this is why we have to be locked into understanding what we invested in and why and what we're trying to accomplish. Because the information that we need to understand these stocks and ETFs is right out there available to us. We just have to be willing to dive in and look. Now, if you guys want to see my previous video about SCHD to understand more about its criteria, click on this video right here. Hope you guys have a great day out there. Financial independence is true freedom. So keep building the stack and wins. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.